Hello everyone, today we talk about war according to the opinion of some uh, thinkers of the recent past, or even contemporary ones, that uh, marked, uh, let's say, a bit the, the history of thought in, in uh, regarding the topic, and that we're going to destroy through phone clouds of it. Well, I don't want to sound so brutal telling you the truth, nor I like iconoclasm more than much. As a matter of fact, there, there are interesting thoughts here and there, but I would like to use this video to explain a little bit the relevance of von Clausewitz as always, but fundamentally also the, um, let's say, aside from the genius of the author to naturally produce something astonishing that it's unique in, in its kind, um, not even properly rare, right? He's the only person who came out with something so complete and thorough and punctual on the topic. But at, at this point in history, uh, definitely the mm, inexplicability of the, mm, let's say, development, certain, at least of certain thoughts that do not take into consideration the von Krieger, and the mistakes uh, that are committed and why they happen fundamentally. And as we'll see, it takes all usually a subjective path, especially in this proves in my crusade, in crusade against hyper-specialization, at least as the sole uh, horizon of scholars, what are the concrete risks? Because you go, can go as far as saying that objectively after the 19th century, uh, in philosophical terms, nothing has been added. I mean, let's be honest, what is that philosophy of learning thing that brought, you know, on, on the force something essentially new from what 19th century philosophy had already uh, explained, pointed out, with, with, a, with a crystalline clear prose logic. I mean, here we could quote many scholars, you know, of those times. And, of course, th this has nothing to do with how eventually these um, ideas were received. And, in fact, that's exactly what we're going to demonstrate today. But, in the case of war, th this is far worse in a sense because naturally it's one of those topics that impact deeply at a political and social level or also weaponize as such in propagandistic form and that uh, to push certain ideologies that can be um, observed in, in this more recent um, theories that do not seem to not take into consideration concepts that by the way were already expressed by von Clausewitz and then instead they seemingly, you know, uh, not totally ignored in, in, in their origin, but fundamentally they were developed from, from, a, from just the specialization standpoint of the scholars and then, you know, taking a path that refused to see the only comprehensive view that, that was already expressed in the, in the von Krieg. Why do I say this? It's a matter of practicality, because also today's philosophy, as we will see, has been heading towards uh, a greater scientificity, right? So certain authors will talk about today, if you pick mm, uh, Witzinga, uh, Lawrence, uh, Schmidt, these were all, you know, great thinkers for, for their times, but objectively, when you realize that less than one century before, von Clausewitz had already, think about Witzinga's, as we will see now, uh, ludic theory. I mean, there is the, the, the 21st chapter of the first book of the von Krieg is this, this title is that war is a, a game, both uh, objectively and subjectively, and explains to you why, and it gives you the foundations in a, in a you know, uh, in in the of, in within that paragraph that is framed within all a theory that, as you know, logically uh, follows like like a chain. A broader point, uh, thoughts that already debunk essentially what this later scholar wrote, and that, surprisingly enough, think about the school of Brussels at that point, that we won't make names nor about authors nor works, but, you know, there are still researches that go on with using as in ideas, but completely ignoring, or mm, at that point, I don't know, I, but some, sometimes you get uh, puzzled by this, because you, you start, usually, th this is my advice, never underestimate someone's intelligence, right, because that will go against you, but sometimes, you know, that will keep your standards high, first of all. And what happens often, I'd say, is that sometimes you, you read something and say, wait, but the, where this person came from from this? And you realize that um, it's not because they, they uh, you know, maybe have a different opinion, having acknowledged that it was another and that maybe they should have 
read or understood. They, they completely ignored anything else. I mean, most of the people who criticize the phone cricket today, we will leave culturalism out, hopefully. But you realize, even just in the way they talk about the phone cricket, you, you understand they haven't even read it. Let, let alone studied it or understood it, but you know, they don't even know what fundamental is written there. And they keep passing on this bullshit about nothing, because, you know, we are told, at least academically speaking, when you want to write something, you should at least have studied carefully what others said before. Um, I won't mm, complain now about why these things happen, broadly speaking, why people buy into that. Of course, it's a matter of of ignorance, generally speaking, but you know, one thing is is the mass that may be ignorant about certain topics, and it's normal because we all are about topics we're not expert in. But the experts should at least provide some reliable information. And I personally can't understand how you can expose yourself so much when there is something so gigantic. Like even if it's not popular, but you know, in the history of thought, like the idea aforementioned von Kriege, and simply passing it by and pretend, you know, acting as if it didn't even exist. Um, here, I presume also, voice listening is acquainted to the broader point of what the von Kriege is, why we, we talk about it, and I, I realize maybe even that, that this is not the case for even for regular followers, because I see that, as always, the von Kriege series is not watched by anyone, uh, or just a very few people compared to the, the broader subscribers. That's another thing we will deal with, you know, in the next um, um, channel update video because it's, um, you know, I can't do anything about it, but surely uh, I can't discuss it because I, it's exactly, in a sense, the same point we're making today. That it's not even about a, a different opinion, it's simply about not giving a damn about learning, right? And giving and having a, a critical capacity to determine the hierarchy of quality information and of of you know authority of, of thought i would say at that point and recognizing authority of thought because if you don't compare many thoughts at least the, the less you know that the that definitely the more you're going to end up like this and and the topic of war is is always uh, enormous inexhaustible i don't know how uh, how long this video will take, frankly, today. Uh, but I I presume that there are certain poignant examples. Uh, if you look, for example, there's Hale in his uh, Armies, Fleets and Art of War that says, quote, in the art gallery of Turin is exposed one of the most lying allegories of that time, which is the 16th century, painted by Lucas de Herre, it was a Flemish Flemish painter represents the destiny of the seven liberal arts in time of war and they are showed to us sleeping in, in good disorder on the side of a hill and in the you know valley below there is uh, a battle going on while uh, from the, ca the councils of the gods Mercury arrives with a message of peace to communicate to the arts that they can wake up again Right. And Hale said, adds something very brilliant, that is, uh, in reality, right, in the reality of, of reality, right, Mercury would have found the hill deserted, and uh, his uh, lovely colleagues committed wholly, body and soul, in the battle, right, rhetorics, uh, committed to incite the soldiers with uh, discourses and manifestos, mathematics occupied to line up the troops according numerical models, music to excite them to battle with fives and drums, encouraged in this by a conception that identified war with musical harmony. We made a video about this. Um, Architecture to give a final touch to a fortress, astronomy to mm, lend a telescope to the favorite general, grammar, uh, busy in taking notes for celebrating victory, and philosophy doing the same in order to justify it. Right. So this is a smart observation. And it is also profoundly true, because factually, um, one of the most specific characteristics of war 
even if our own hypocrisy, right, our daily hypocrisy, um, tends to, you know, to censor this, consists in concentrating the most elevated human capacities, in tending them to the maximum grade with the aim of uh, achieving uh, an intensely wanted uh, end. And it can be also observed to reassure ourselves that what this end that is so intensely wanted is the reestablishment of peace in a sense. But the fact is that war frees formidable human energies uh, in spite of you know how many it also destroys. Uh, so this is a very important starting point because it, it's not just about recognizing the importance of war uh, in the history of mankind and the deep um, and renowned improvements in, in technology, in medicine, in every kind of of science fundamentally that were brought by war. Um, but it's properly realizing that war is the moment in which human ingenuity reaches its peak. And we have explained this many times. Um, and it's simply demonstrated by the pressure that war poses in itself. Um, this is difficult to understand for many already. Today we'll try to debunk a lot of, of, of myths in a sense. Um, and why? Because we think that war, right, this is a kind of a culturalist approach that we loathe like, like hell, um, is, is to believe that war is somewhat an activity like another, right, that we engage into simply because we feel like it, Right, because we're not, re, uh, you know, rational enough, or uh, it's just something that we didn't know it was it was so terrible, and we just found out when we started. These are the kind of idiotic preconceptions that actually a, a, a large amount of people legitimately own, according to themselves. I mean, the the idea that war is just a bad idea, man, and that um, you know it shouldn't be done because it's possibly the worst of anything that can happen, right? Um, this derives from an emotionalistic approach, naturally, that in turn also confirms the reason why uh, war brings on, on the fore all the possible ingenuity. Um, first of all, one could easily answer that uh, for, you know, even if, if this approach was true, you know, there is somebody who attacks and another who, who has to cope with that, and uh, so is. is it's not a warmonger, but it's brought into it and should know what war is, in, if, if anything, for wanting to, to win it, right? So um, that doesn't actually explain why even war is fought, but it, it shows that from a moral standpoint, at that point, for, for, for he has to, to defend himself, or at least for who finds himself engulfed into it, you know, where or another, without being the responsible for it, is you know, has to cope with, with some way. You know, even here the concept of attack and defense is a, just a, you know, ban binary conception of war that by itself doesn't explain uh, was, was right, was wrong, right? If there was anyone so naive to believe it's, it, that there, there is a moral order in that regard. I mean, um, it's not that you, if you defend, you're automatically the good guy, right? And the attacker is automatically the bad guy. Von Clausewitz goes as far, it's a bit provocatory, but it gets to the point. And as we were saying now, that actually it's he who, who attack, who starts the war that wants peace the most, right? Because he is the one who has the most energies to eventually make it end. Right, he is the one that is so determined to commit. Just the other day, we were, I mean, in these days, we are uh, explaining the relations existing, the strategy and tactics between uh, attack and defense, uh, in by commenting the von Kriege, and we've seen how determined the um, and how you know much he's prone to. You know the, the attacker is prone to to spend in order to win because of the intrinsic advantage of the defense in general terms, and how therefore who starts that is usually somebody who has a much greater motivation to get it done with, right? And the defender that 
as long as it remains a defender without counterattack and it's just making the war longer and wants it to, to become longer. So this can already puzzle uh, some mind in that regard. And no, being an attacker and defender is not a criterion, nor politically, nor historically, nor morally, nor sociologically, or whatever, to say, okay, you're, you're, you're right uh, because you defend and you're wrong because you attack. It doesn't work like that. Um, because with that uh, purpose, you wouldn't even help a person who is defending himself, and that that is succumbing to, to an aggression. Um, but properly, the the reason why the best of humanity is committed in war is a reason. It's almost a physical one. It's uh, about the the amount of it per time that is war puts you under a pressure that is unknown fundamentally in any other, you know, average human activity. Right, it's not that war has made civilization, as some came out to, to believe, which is wrong. But most of civilization accomplishments, um, you can say, first of all, they cannot be detached from war in a way or another. But we have had to quantitatively detach the things happen, and sometimes of with much greater impact than 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 any war, but over a much longer period of time. And with dynamics that often encompass a much greater amount of humanity, let's say broadly meant in terms of moral material resources of people involved, um, that eventually uh, are not dramatically pressured at the moment for it, at least not as much as in war, that is something so contingent and immediate you have to, 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 to do, right? Even war in itself is most of the times not a good idea, but it's just the speediest one. So war has that from its side, right? That's mostly uh, its advantage if we were to to generalize, broadly speaking. Uh, but specifically, humanity in this times and space, let's say, dimension, remains always the same, which means that when you're pressured by something so intense by war, that is so cir circumscribed and, you know, concrete and material, and you can't fundamentally escape, you as a human are not, uh, will be pressured, in a, in, you know, in such a way in order to get out of it alive, uh, and hope, uh, hopefully victorious, that you will bring on the fore the best of yourself, uh, of your human capacities to fix it, that are chiefly m moral forces, that is mostly intelligence, in, in form of rationality, determination, that is a particular form of courage that makes you act upon your, your, under, you know, your understanding, your intelligence, and not just, you know, being intelligent, knowing what to do, but not having the guts of taking it, um, to the end of the line, uh, and this naturally dramatically develops the individual being that is con is is present in there. Naturally, wars are fought by many people, so this has nothing to do eventually with you know. This is what I often say, uh, and which is pretty macroscopically evident from a historical point of view that living through a war, participating to a war, has basically virtually nothing to do with understanding what what war is about. Right? Never think that somebody who's gone to war has by itself such a dramatic understanding of war. Because from an individual point of view, unless he's not being a commander um, of some, you know, large unit, or, you know, uh, um, he will not fundamentally understand the broader implications of war. We'll just know how hard it is to, you know, to, to fight in it, which is something we would never uh, have any human to test uh, for how uh, horrible it is, but that by itself has absolutely zero to do with understanding the broader political, historical, social implications of what that war is fought in the first place, or even know how to, to fight it in the, in the first place. And this is absolutely crystalline. I mean, look at interviews, veterans, or whatever, you know, all the respect for, for, for the people, but find a person there that express, I don't know, on average, uh, you know, an historical judgment that elevates from the average of of, of civilians, right? It's, there is not, right? Because these are things that must be studied to be understood, right? Being there in the front line, risking your life, pulling a trigger is, is terrible. It surely teaches you something in your life you will ne that will be useful, right? Will be useful for you. And you, you maybe wish you not to have ever learned that some people, unfortunately, have it worse in, in that matter uh, in the end. But the question which is very often, but it happens very often, as we know, because of all the, the, the stresses, the, the traumas, and so on. But it, per se, right, the, the nature of war is, is absolutely, you know, the, the one that, that you can't grasp from an elevated position. The higher you go, the more synthesis capability, the more knowledge you have about it, not whether you risk your life recklessly. Like, because at that point, it could be 
you know, you could engage into other activities. Okay, war is quite unique, maybe in that sense, but once again, it's a minimal logic here. I, I minimal in the sense that it takes into consideration the individual perspective that is dramatically narrow, right? Without any further look at uh, broader uh, picture. And uh, I know that this is also something that on average people do not like to listen to because we have developed in fact this subjectivistic and emotionalistic view of war for which we are acquainted by even the arts by the movie etc to, to this kind of almost uh, first person shooter idea of war right the, the, the important thing is not to understand the deep political strategical implication of a war and what makes war factually massively from a material point of view that the one it is also from a moral point of view for that matter because somebody has to decide that and all the political and social process behind it the decision etc no it's about the fact oh look war is terrible look at these two guys the, the enemies that meet and do not want to kill each other and all these you know moving stories that is just an emotionalist re reaction i'm sorry i mean it can be inspiring it can be beautiful but we have we have to be uh, you know, very honest about this at a mass culture, popular level, we'll, we're building the idea of war exclusively on that base, right? Any kind of strategical culture of military historical understanding, um, the theory art of war is like, does an average person acquire that even just, uh, you know, from a military historical perspective? No. And let's be completely honest here because. The worst you can do, and this is what war teaches you, is that it is lying to yourself, is pretending to make something work uh, in order to explain things that reality shows you that is not the case. And war is literally, as we were saying before, because of that pressure, the worst place where you can even imagine to do that. And on the contrary, the one that brings on the fore the a what actually works. Right? It's not a surprise that um, the military is, uh, you know, worldwide, also historically, you know, some of the most you know, uh, functionalized part, branches of society, right? Some of the greatest civilizations, fundamentally, the most efficient parts of their, of, of their, in fact, society w was, was the army because it was effectively the one that had to cope with concrete problems, not just with that diluted amount of pressure that can be seen in, in ever more relative perspective and that may bring to certain broader political and social changes, but when has to get the thing done, right, uh, crashes against the, the ignorance of the necessity that at the moment reality presents you with. And this is in war more than in any other activity. Of course, I don't know, I can think of natural disasters or other terrible things, those also pressure you in that regard, but war is peculiar for a number of reasons that if you follow the von Krieger series we have explained, if anything, uh, because you're actually fighting against someone else, right, this is not like an earthquake that makes a mess, lots of people die, every, you know, it, it, but at a, a certain point it stops, you just fix it. No, you're f in war, you're fighting against somebody who wants you dead, right, or, and compelling, at least, you know, from militarily wise and politically speaking, you know, to, full, uh, to compel you to fulfill his will. Uh, which is an enormous deal, also given that wars are normally something fought on, on, on a large scale, right? By, you know, by, of course, varying standards, but still a big deal considering the costs that they, they, they have um, altogether. So here we're not even commenting any other moralistic or humanitarian position, right? Always remember that von, the, the von Clausewitz starts the von Krieger with, not randomly, with the statement that if you think that fighting war should be done, waging war should be done uh, humanely, you're actually going to cause more deaths than, than not, right? So uh, war, in, if, if anything, is if you really need to fight one, if you, which is even here, uh, the need is relative. Uh, every war can be avoided. This is true, right? Uh, today we will talk quite harshly against pacifism, that is by far one of the most passive aggressive ideologies it can ever be, but um, we have to be honest about the fact that war is always avoidable, which has zero to do whether it has to be avoided or not, which is true in most of the cases, we we're saying for most of the times a violent resolution of conflict is a bad idea, uh, there are other ways, uh, sometimes you don't quite have an option, 
right few times actually and we, as we've seen war is mostly on average the speediest of solutions um, but von Clausewitz says specifically that if you you know if you really have to fight a war let it be quick right commit as many resources as you can at a given moment given that as we'll see you will never manage to reach that absolute of, of total war that will explain in a sense because that's exactly a concept that von Clausewitz used to demonstrate that in reality in our physical reality total war cannot exist right that there were people who you know expand in this create think about the Nazis that you know the idea of total war the idea of you know since we fight for a country if the country risks uh, is threatened to be wiped out we have we have to employ every single resource of the country so that war governs politics and, and not vice versa according to the cause of it guess guess we lost the second world war right you know and that's also for the sake of saying you know, you know, let's look at somebody who studied war and realize that his has nothing to do with loving war or, you know, being a warmonger. If you read some passages from from phone clauses, you realize that how much the person understood as a, as a general during the, the Napoleonic Wars, enlisted at 12 and having made all the, in the Prussian army, making all the career from, from bottom to top. Well, what, war, you know, war, yes. Most of the times it's a bad idea, but this has nothing to do with our judgment. Our judgment has to be rational, first and foremost. That is another thing that um, a few people say, well, war is irrational by definition because it's so primitive, just barbarians. So no, this is culturalist bullshit. War is decided by the top of society. That is the most rational, um, as in the close of its in Trinity is shown also by the nature of politics. That is, as we've seen, the one is a I was saying before, is accomplish it with the most pressing realities, not with ideologies meant just like that. And yes, uh, we have told history badly because naturally many people will say, oh, just look at that crazy ass of Hitler and you realize it's not the case. Well, that's a pretty ignorant statement in the sense that um, uh, World War II didn't happen because of the crazy guy at the top, but of the millions at the bottom, first of all, that brought him up at the top. The guy was uh, was definitely strange, yes, but it was not crazy in the sense that, you know, he was just, you know, w wishing war for no reason. There were histori unjustifiable historical, though, reasons that brought to, to, to the freaking disaster. He was, by the way, the only one that, even in, in certain contexts, believed that certain things could, could, could be carried out and nobody had thought of and made it try and have succeeded, which is something even more, more disturbing because at that point you realize that uh, yes, he wasn't that great mind. He actually committed enormous mistakes, fortunately, because, you know, that's also how the war was, was lost. But still, uh, you know, uh, what you would say a crazy person in, in general is, is not a person who achieves that, right? And we have to be very cautious, even in there, from a moral point of view, why and that happens. And never, and always remember that wars cannot be fought, but with the 50% plus something, of the uh, moral forces uh, of of the community that fights it, right? And speaking especially of the 20th century, those moral resources were much more distributed in a, in a democratic sense than it was, I don't know, in feudal Europe. Uh, even here, well, we could, we could debate because today's video does touch these things. That is, certain things are not even so easy to, you know, to, to, to explain with a, such a tranchant um, explanation. Um, but uh, broadly speaking, here the point is that war should be decided whether to be done or not at every given moment. That is, first of all, politics has uh, always war as an option. Secondly, uh, reality always changes, so you you can never know what to do. And we mostly in life, as for anything, uh, we we don't really know what it's gonna happen next and therefore there is n no such thing like uh, being able to foresee certain consequences right you can understand that certain things are bad ideas other that are kind of better but at the end of the day war exactly because of that pressure that we were talking about before is also one of the mo single most unpredictable human activities probably the the, the greatest one in consider relatively to the the amount of resources involved that as we uh, were saying before are still you know measurable through a human um, parameter single human parameter so um, 
what I want to say is that pretending to say we should ever fight a war or we should never fight a war is not a moral statement, right? Pacifism is wrong because at that point we should have not even liberated Europe from from Nazi fascist oppression, right? Who, who can there be so... See, I honestly, I think I've never met, I've never met have enormous contacts with, you know, but let's say a pacifist person that went cornered with the most simple question of, you know, then you should never help even persons who get attacked because the, the problem is that you should never use violence, would say no, right? Uh, that's where, that that's so intuitive. I mean, and that's also the idea of war we should start be very careful um, about because war, as we'll see today, it, it, it's it's something that we can, by approximation, with a good degree of accuracy, but still with approximation, know where it starts and where it ends, right? Dramatically more difficult is to to understand what where conflict begins and ends. You could even say it's innate in humans, and that the reasons for any war is something that is lost in 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 the dawn of times. But war is concretely the violent mean enacted, so you can measure when it starts. Right? It starts sometimes even you know moderately. Uh, then it can uh, escalate into you know. Uh, you know, pretty intense things, um, but still, that is war, and never commit the mistake that is done by, for example, using as, you know, you know, I don't even know to, to say them, pupils, I would say, that to, to commit the, the most atrocious and idiotic mistake of not understanding even the difference between conflict and war, right? War is violence, the uh, violence enacted. Right, it doesn't even matter whether whether it's a brawl or a war declared between countries, because nobody declares wars anymore. By the way, uh, I don't know if you noticed internationally, um, but that's still war. Always remember, war is nothing but a duel on a large scale, or and that the, the largeness of that scale is just up to you to determine. But here we're talking about forms of violence that can't go for anything, right? Any kind of violence that is a mean, that is an instrument. Right, it can't be the same form of violence, but enacted for the best or, or worst, um, you know, reasons. Right? Um, think about violence against women. A man beating a woman to to to, to blood, and uh, the same man hopefully getting bitten by someone else for what he has done. It's the same mean, but the first one is a pretty disgusting thing. The second thing is, you know, better left to to authority. But still, in that moment, saying, saying the woman beaten, in my opinion, is, a, and with all respect, of course, also with violence inflicted on men, that, 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 um, that does happen as well. But we know that the scale of the problem is at the other balance as well. So that is a pretty good example of how, uh, of also the incoherence vu, vu, of, of people that, uh, and often the extreme violence of people that are, ideologically radical and extremistic about these topics. Like, a person that says violence should never be used is a person that, in my opinion, is m way more likely to use violence for, for, m for the wrong reasons and without knowing how to, right, and therefore causing more problems and more to, to himself and, and the rest of the world than a person who accepts that violence is there and, and, and thinks exactly knowing what it is, that is uh, something pretty serious, how to discipline, how to regulate it, and knowing how to use it, however, when it's needed. So this is, broadly speaking, the philosophy where, you know, we come from um, in Clausewitz in terms. Or always remember that von Clausewitz never uh, gives you uh, a reason for making war, which is one of the highest uh, moral positions, if not the highest moral position it could take, because it just teaches you what war is and how it works and how you can win one, right? But then you are responsible for enacting that violence or not, right? And realizing, because knowing how that works tells you how it, in, in I mean, in uh, always with approximation, because as we've seen, this is no deterministic or predictable uh, system you can you know sort out the outcome of, um, but it will make you understand better how this is likely to be declined in reality, right? And um, you know and, and coping with. It. But today we don't talk about the von Krieg specifically, but just see how you know certain positions are completely oblivious of of this work and why it is important. Um, so as 
for the humanitarian aspects. Um, so first of all, from a moralistic point of view, you understand immediately how difficult it is even to judge, right? Because one thing is like two people fighting in the street. If you take international matters, things start getting very complicated, but not just not because you can't properly identify, you can't make relativism about it, right? But it's debatable what, what you can't spot there. Actually, reality at that scale should give you much more evidence to judge certain aspects. But the whole thing is in, in, in the absolute terms that will make the difference between life and death of maybe hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians much more blurry in reality. So maybe you understand better the clash between two countries as long as you are actually acquainted with the with the I mean the scientific literature and, and evidence on the topic, then you are maybe about judging two people's reactions in a certain sense um, against each other. So moralistically speaking, we should always be very very humble and to at least understand that before judging we should know. Right, should be informed, we should have an education, we should get the, the evidence in front of us and then judge. And that's the best you thing you can do. Judging is important, right? Never think it being judgmental is, is wrong, right? Being judgmental is wrong as, as long as you don't know what you're talking about. But as humans, we are meant to make a difference in everything and that difference is just making through a judgment and actually, actually acting upon the same if we really believe it's right. Um, Humanitarianly wise, as we were saying before, von Clausewitz is, is very clear about this. War is, a, is an instrument, is an activity that we um, carry out in order to achieve something else. Specifically, war is uh, an instrument of war. Nothing else. War in itself is nor... It doesn't matter how heavy it is, how much impact it's going to achieve, but in itself, it's not uh, good or evil. Right, that is to be left to 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 a sphere um, that is political, that is social. Others will determine that. War, the, the choice of war and and fighting it can be judged in that sense. But war per se, right, is not loaded. It's a pure instrument. It doesn't have a soul, right. And there were there was somebody, as we will see with uh, Le Maistre, that had kind of a you know pantheistic. Um, idea of war um, almost, right? Uh, the idea that, that this permeates as a spirit to the world, uh, that's it's been psychoanalyzed, it's not very uh, reassuring, but it, it's interesting for, for other reasons. But uh, von Clausewitz says something specific, that war, in this regard, is fought with its own logic, with its own mechanics, that by itself, in its proceedings, mm, is not humane. That is, war, yes, is, is not human. It's not, in a sense, the, the primitive self of ours that, is, uh, is, that breaks free. Um, it's something more, right? And the complexity of war is naturally summed up in the Clausewitzian trinity, this um, emotion, chance, reason, or sometimes violence, chance, and probability that, mm, even as a concept, simply surpasses by far any... Uh, you know, of, of the scholars we're seeing here, because they, they're just fixating on one aspect and even getting it wrong. So they're completely, I mean, just from, from the sheer scale of intellectual capacity, you know, children in front of, of mature people um, when confronting with, with the clause of its interior. Um, that's why you, you, you can't get the, the scale there of, of the, 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 the failure, if you want, also of a civilization in understanding war, which is not reassuring at all, right? You could say that. Um, this is also part of the reason uh, why w w the 20th century was the one it was and the 19th century was made better overall. Uh, also in here there is no teleology or determinism to be applied but we have to to also understand certain authors. I mean Yudzinga, I don't know, died a prisoner during World War II. So, is a person that lived through very hard times. You, you have to understand where these wars come from and the 20th century was surely shocked humanity. We have to be uh, aware of that, but we can't. We have to try to, to, to rationalize that. We have to understand it, how harsh it was. We have to, the, the best thing we can do for ourselves to get rid of emotionalism and getting things wrong is to make this enormous effort to be objective, to be impartial, to, 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 to take side when, of course, certain things like senseless massacre of civilian happens, but for the rest, maintaining a uh, um, 
an analytical capacity of scientific profile. That is the only solution that we understand to human things. Uh, even when discussing about and, and feeling, um, we are we are we are moved by by feelings, right? We're no, not moved by rationality. Rationality is just a tool. I mean, there we use to 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 fulfill our uh, our pleasures in a sense. Um, but it's surely something that can help us understand the world and the, the, and, and in in the most effective way. Mm -hmm. So never be so silly like saying, you know, after all, this is, you know, war is a big deal because it's war. No, war is a big deal because you have to count, I don't know, how many people you actually killed. And even, you know, being pretty careful about the fact that even if you, if you make mistake, even by one, you, you're, you're counting uh, a, a human life more or less. And if that human life was yours, well, I think you would... You would care also never embrace emotionalistic approaches especially when we, when we talk about war because that's literally the worst thing you can do for yourself for others for for our understanding of the world broadly meant and specifically meant so the proceedings of war are not humane we have to understand it von Clausewitz demonstrates it in his work i discussed it here we can't digress further but to to, to get you know, it gets down to, yes, the the idea of war is just uh, compelling the enemy to fulfill your will, but given the way w reality is made in terms of political and social groups' interactions in the physical world, uh, we came up with armies for, for specific reasons, etc., to fight against each other in that way, and it gets down to literally killing, right? War is about not killing innocent civilians, it's killing the, each other's military, right? And bring it at that point to a moral collapse. I mean, you know, that will not end with everybody killed. Um, we are not ants, <laughs> and uh, even in fact, theological, you know, parallelisms there. We should we should be extremely careful with because the war we intend here has nothing to do with the animal world, if not by some you know uh, biological dimension that doesn't explain the way humans make war and, and, and that, that is, there's an activity that no other species actually does right that the other species do fight uh, and and that, that, that aggressiveness that is, is pretty evidently there but it's still not war in the way we we, we make it, and we've always done humanly, uh, I can say, I mean, humanly is what, because here we should talk about the origins of war, when did wars start, right, that's another, we will make a video about that, but at least, you know, historically, right, that's how we, and it doesn't answer the question, but historically, we we evolved also on, on the base of this, um, uh, this way of war that is always the same, right, uh, other important realization of Clausewitz and theories that war is fundamentally always the same. The war that this, here we can't digress on uh, certain aspects such as the idea that uh, you have no idea how many charlatans s sell books by writing this but, but the idea that, that, that the war now is different because we have drones right you know the, this kind of statement. Uh, war is always the same Right, the, the way it's declined has nothing to do with the intrinsic dynamics that that constitute it, and and this speaks a universal that is a human language. If you don't get that, you will fixate on things that are very subjective, will they're relative, that will change. Right, as we arrive to this historically, we will arrive to something else afterwards, and maybe we'll go back and forth. Maybe we'll be circles. It will never be the same. Right, but war intrinsically in its logic, is always the same, right? It functions always in the same way. And this sounds like a, you know, uh, charismatic statement, but it's really not. It's a, it's a scientific, it's a physical one, right? We, we know that. We, and that's why you should study the Fonkri. And I advise you warmly to follow, at least, you know, to study the work, right? Not reading it, right? Studying it, possibly in the original language. If you don't know German, well, yes, you can find a translation, but... I also made this series now, more than 200 videos, explain it step by step, so that can, you know, a bit of self-promotion, you will allow me at some point. Um, it's, uh, it, it is to be understood. It's not to be listened to, right, with audiobooks or stuff. It has to be studied, right, precisely.
at your table with no distractions step by step it takes years yes and that's why I guess it's not such a popular thing but if you want the best you must make an effort for it um, so humanly speaking yes war is about killing each other it in that sense it's it's not humane in, in, in the sense that not that war doesn't belong to humanity or that is a denial of humanity. On the contrary, it's one of the very few things that actually characterize humanity because no other species does this, right? War is inhumane in the sense that, it, so not inhuman, but inhumane because it has as an objective to kill, right? It, it passes through that. To kill was fighting against you. Um, and there's no way out of that. So that from that uh, realization stems also the, the concept that the, 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 uh, the warmer you are about this uh, and, and the more kills you're going to cause. Because in the moment in which you will realize that what you need is to kill in that se in sense, it will be, you will have understood it the bad way. It is you will have gained a disadvantage Right, and you will need to compensate. That would have been prolonged the war, would have made ever more people killed. So in that sense, uh, being humanitarian doesn't help to save people's lives in war. Quite the contrary. Um, and it doesn't matter how legitimate or you know reasonable such moralistic humanitarian points can sound. They are not. Right, they they sound like that because we are meant, after all, to to behave differently. War is not uh, a barbaric degeneration, an instinctual degeneration, exactly because it goes against something so essential like instinct of self-preservation. We are flattered by such ideas because we presume that at the end of the day. We can avoid war just if we are good, nice people, right? We don't know that in three seconds, if triggered by the the, the uh, certain circumstances, we are biologically, genetically programmed to be able to kill a person, right? In three seconds, right? Um, that is a hard realization. It's a it's a disturbing one, but if you think that it's just you know your current mood uh, dictating what is going to happen to humanity fighting or not fighting wars, well, chances are that if you, you know, I hope you'll never get in a war. <laughs> you will nev never have to decide for other people's lives what that is going to be. Um, and especially such moralistic humanitarian attitudes do not help us. This is, I would say, the core of the problem because of the importance also of the rationale in war. To understand on a historical and sociological level and more that is also how to wage it the nature and the characters of war right um, and while the history of war is of um, you know invaluable importance for making us understand history altogether because the cause of its trinity is also about this right and um, that emotion, chance, reason has to do respectively with society, mi the military, and politics, right? So you can't actually separate these things. It's not that the Trinity just exists when war is on. Um, politics and societies are always on, as long as we are human beings, right? So, and, and war is always there, even if you're not finding it at the moment as an option. Right in the aggressivity, in the in the conflict, as we will see, it's always there. There is always a trigger that can make it explode at some point, and not because of the bad, stupid uh, few tyrants. No, it happens because the majority of society has wanted it. Right, and this is a terribly actual topic, by the way. And speaking of Schwerpunkt and the topics we discuss in here, we we mostly deal with. Um, let's say mm, a description, let's say of, of warfare throughout um, specifically, you know, medieval, ancient part of also, especially early modern history. And we haven't 
uh, let's say stressed um, I'd say too much the um, I would say the problem of relation between war and progress first of all because it's very debatable I mean it is true that war has catalyzed certain phenomena like I don't know the rise of the modern state um, the essentially decentralization of society uh, in um, as much as political control that starts from military needs and it is true uh, it is true still today if anything because it corresponds to one principle principle of war itself that is the unit of command so the larger the society the more the need to of control the more productive or more powerful the more vital it becomes right because it's that order that we we were searched the end of the day to to get a benefit right war is fought generally speaking because you think you're going to get something from it that is gonna help you more process At the end of the day it's all about the continuation of the species right it could today we don't talk about that it's actually a very fascinating topic especially Lawrence um, wrote about this I like Lawrence work actually as you well understand here albeit you know it's also outdated we went beyond if anything from a biological point of you know understanding um, but uh, it, it, it's one of the older that stressed of course the what von Clausewitz at that point had already pointed out I mean there is definitely a, a, an instinctual you know primordial enmity that within us the conflict is part of you know it's how we we deal with reality even when we don't fight against anybody you know we we get stimulated in that aggressive sense to to make sense even to bring an order into chaos we know that psychologically we we tend to do that and that's also the the ga the gambling the uh, the chance uh, that pertains specifically to to the military right of the trinity of the triad the military is the one is most attracted by the ga gambling, right? Whereas politics is the most rational, and society is n the most emotional, and often also the more the most violent, properly man. I mean, this the most aggressive and most um, undisciplined in that regard. Um, it would be interesting to expand further. Never made a video on the cause of its trinity proper, but it's one of those concepts that are so damn insightful and that today we'll see how fundamentally they were ignored by some of the you know allegedly greatest thinkers on these topics um, yeah so forgive my reverence but we have to be honest about this uh, so we can start from Huizinga Johan Huizinga um, who came up <coughs> with an idea that is also in my opinion I don't know because I haven't studied the, the, the world war I, I don't know where it stems from but you know it, the, of, of the ludic character of war that as we were saying before it's been already stated pretty clearly and also more neatly and rationally and verifiably by phone clauses right um, the idea in in, in 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 a sense that war is a sort of recreational activity that um, um, stem from a from a playful nature of mankind and that um, brought in in that doesn't quite um, um, explain by the way why um, th this paradox would have come about meaning if you're trying to explain war through through the idea it's a game for humans um, you should explain at least why it happens and I would read the the close of it's in passage first in fact this is from book first par, um, chapter 21 says war is a game both objectively and subjectively von Clausewitz says if we now take a look at the subjective nature of war that is to say at those conditions under which it is carried on it will appear to us still more like a game primarily it's more like by the way it's not you know it, it's a, a game as we've seen both objectively and subjectively because it has those characteristics but it's still you know a game in a in abstract sense because it says primarily the element in which the operations of war are carried on is danger mm -hmm. and we'll remember why this is important but which of all the moral qualities uh, is the first in danger courage 
Now, certainly Courage is quite compatible with prudent calculation, but still they are things of quite different kind, essentially different qualities of the mind. On the other hand, daring reliance on good fortune, boldness, rashness, are only different, um, are only expressions of courage, and all these propensities of the mind look fortuitous or accidental, because it is their element. We see, therefore, how from the commencement the absolute, the mathematical, as it is called, nowhere finds any sure basis in the calculations in the art of war, and that from the outset there is a play of possibilities, probabilities, good and bad luck, which spreads about with all the course and the fine trends of its web, and makes war of all branches of, of human activity the most like a gambling game. Right, a spiel meant in this uh, realm of chance and therefore of danger because of what is at stake and what is more than, than in a war. So, Yitzinga s stresses this ludical aspect, making a sort of degenerative, tracing a sort of degenerative picture of what war has developed like historically because it says that there is this form of. Um, you know, in uh, Yudzinga talked m mostly differently from his pupils from about uh, more kind of ar archaic times where war, uh, he wrote this war and game, you know, Homo Ludens, first of all. Um, he, um, so he talks about war and game, and, and, and this idea was somewhat uh, understood by both by Yudzinga and his same pupils as a sort of paradox, right? Um, maybe from their perspective because it seems that they are two so different things because we attribute to game kind of a childish stupid kind of nature well war the worst thing ever war is objectively and subjectively a game and games are pretty damn dead serious things right and therefore already this framing of the problem is basically denying uh, a dignity both to war and games in, in, in all they can encompass and this is not very flattering for human intelligence, first of all, nor for those who support the idea. Um, but especially the historical um, vision from Uizinga is essentially that war was a sort of a recreational activity, right? And the fact that um, a, an enemy, I, I don't know how, honestly how Uizinga is, you know, even thinking that, you know, risking your life is a recreational thing. Of course, he, he probably has some point in, in, in as much as, you know, there is an attraction towards this, uh, you know, as we were saying before, putting order into chaos, right? But the idea that war is something recreational, that is to say, you just fight it because you don't know what else to do, uh, doesn't sound very realistic. First of all, Zinga does give, uh, does attribute a sort of nobility to this recreational game, um, and he says that you know in this more primitive societies, war was accepted in the, this most ritualized form because I guess he starts from that as well. I mean the idea that yes, I mean there are certain historical realities where war does take a kind of a ritual, uh, takes on a kind of a ritual character, but we'll see now what you know fundamentally. It doesn't uh, at the end of the day. I mean, at least it's not its fundamental character. It's still about putting the enemy in a condition of inferiority and wiping it out, uh, in making it lose in some way. And that is not a recreation, right? That is something else, right? And he says that such ritualization stamp and, and that becomes war in itself in this, in this war game, right? Uh, from a sort of mutual respect for the enemy. Right, ritualization is saying, okay, we will fight on this ground and with these rules, and then we'll see who wins or not. Right, there is something of that in military history. That this is not to be denied. I mean, anthropologically speaking, we know pretty well uh, how these things worked. I mean, we talked even in Schwerpunkt a lot of kind of the ritualization of warfare. But first of all, this doesn't take on a, an essential character. War is still about killing for obtaining something, right? This is not torture in the sense of, I don't know, pick the ancient Germans who said, you know, they simply, you know, didn't know what to do. The chieftains had fun and making young men running naked among blades and see, you know, who, who made it through, right? And that's vicious, in, in, as you understand. And the, it, it was functional at that point 
in, even it's in, in its recreational um, aspect to the training, right? That at the time, in those tribes not being their central status, whatever, they, they would compensate with this atrocious, you know, individualistic uh, kind of um, reliance that it's what tribes can do at, at their best, fundamentally, and not having other means uh, that, you know, civilizations ner learn how to, to bring to the next step of, col of intensive, col intense collective discipline. Um, but behind this idea of war as a recreational activity, there is not the historical evidence of the fact that wars have been always, first of all, you know, they, they could wipe out on a regular base entire tribes, communities, whatever, so that, you know, what are the rules of that game? Wiping each other out, is how is that recreational exactly for, you know, for anybody involved? Because, you know, historically speaking, yes, there was the most powerful, but as we've seen also, the, the, the further... Uh, the, the backward going time, the more we see how, you know, um, uh, asymmetry decreases um, in a certain sense. So even the outcomes could be different. And normally, Vu, uh, with a too great disadvantage in war, doesn't even fight one, right? Um, and things are resolved through other channels that are political and social. Um, so how is this realm of danger equatable to essentially just a recreation, like a card game or a match, right? Von Clausewitz stresses that war is a game because it has a gambling nature, that is, you're freaking risking a lot in it, not because you want to recreate. And I don't know by which military historical standard uh, Uzinga can come up with such an idea, but the worst is, in a sense, that his pupils have developed uh, further his ideas by, you know, bringing it to the contemporary slash, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, absolutistic, I would say at some point, controversial level by saying that basically. Um, Modern war uh, and especially I don't know the uh, the invention and the use of uh, of nuclear weapons and so on is somewhat a pro I don't know how they explain it frankly but you know uh, the the concept of total war I mean they they however attribute it so they they take it into consideration as um as a real thing like I, I presume total war is a form of uh, we can't uh, we, we can't wipe each other out now. That is not exactly what total war is supposed to mean. Uh, first of all, in the Clausewitz, in theory, and in 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 the actual human potential. Um, and no, that's not total war, right? Even destroying the entire Earth, practically, it doesn't matter how totalizing the thing seems from a, from our subjective standpoint, because total war would entail essentially a tendency towards the absolute of any kind of of fort whatsoever. Uh, launching a, a nuclear weapon is not uh, a sum of that effort. It's something extremely different. It would be the maximization of all possible uh, weapons at, at every time, not pushing a, pushing a button for, for launching just that weapon. Right. Also, because we have lost more, and because we can't do much worse if we wanted, and if we could, we would need a motivation there. Well, these pupils go on by saying that uh, this... Therefore, I translate total war into I, what I presume they, they believe this, this kind of modern way of making, or not even of making, but, you know, our potential de destructiveness that as the general decline of human civilization. Now, if you didn't notice, uh, fucking civilization evolved towards this direction. So you have to give me a standard there. What is civilization for you? Would like to be a primitive tribesman that, you know, goes out there raping and killing and exterminating and enslaving its own people on a regular base or leaving our own world that also throws a lot of wars exactly because of nuclear weapons. And what kind of decline of, of civilization are we talking about? Like, do you think that in the 19th century, because we didn't have nuclear weapons, we'd made war in a less dangerous, violent way for, you know, for humanity, broadly speaking, um, in terms of actual people killed, uh, or, you know, look at a freaking statistic of how, you know, things went down. We live in actually a pretty pacific way of time, and it doesn't seem that our civilization has particularly declined, on the contrary, right? And uh, they bring this in, in the, you know, in the equation, of course, the, 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 the ludic element of uh, Uzinga by saying that, you know, this decline of civilization is particularly visible in the fact that game has become more and more marginalized in our culture. How is that even true or what does it even mean? I don't, I don't really understand, right? Uh, 
look at you know, the, the the millions of people that you know have uh, that just play video games all the entire lives and it seems we can have our lazy youth playing all the time exactly because we live in, in a world that has made us afford to, to, to more recreation instead than breaking our backs on, on fields as we've done for, for millennia uh, or you know in fact killing exterminating each other on a regular base so these are kind of uh, it th this is this sounds even worse than culturalism in a sense because at least culturalism at, in, by certain instances takes into account you know a, a bit the fact that that warfare has, you know, it does evolve in, in different directions. I mean, here it's the, the general decline of human civilization, and here it's always the, 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 the moving emotionalistic story, oh, you know, we're declining, we're so bad, human civilization goes down because now we, we have nuclear weapons. What a terrible thing. No, if anything, that should push you to responsibilize yourself even more, acknowledging that the fact that we have nuclear weapon is because we are a civilization and that there's a freaking rational reason for which we have nuclear weapons. Right, um, and this this hasn't to do uh, in, in itself in the debate whether to use nuclear weapons or not, or how it should be regulated better. Uh, this has specifically to do with the fact that uh, this is not at all a sign of decline of human civilization by any stretch of the imagination. It's on the contrary, some of its greatest uh, accomplishments and, and achievements. Right, and if you think that uh, a, a tribal warfare was was less cruel because it was like a game, right? They wanted just to play, to have a recreation. But just take a look on the statistics that I even inserted in this video somewhere in the background of the degree of mortality by, by killing in the surviving tribal societies that still exist in the world and in, I don't know, North America or Europe, right? And you'll find basically these guys are fucking killing each other, you know, on a regular basis, at least dramatically more then, then of course, the, you know our our world where you know we we are literally at the lowest level of people killed, and guess why? Because we are a freaking civilization, right? So that tells you. But you know, people who want to sound pseudo intellectual, I qu quote you know Huizing and the Luxembourg uh, school, and these are ah so important. Now, it's interesting, of course, that Huizinga came up with this ludic aspect character of war right I'm, I'm not now I'm totally honest here I, I've never studied the world work of the old I don't know how you know how it gets it but if this is the essentials these are the essentials and uh, what is followed up uh, with that is just like those concepts like geopolitics or you know it's something that even doesn't make sense R logically rationally I mean it does it linguistically right so uh, I don't believe at all in this. War is a game, but it's not a game because it's recreational. It's a, an incredibly disturbing, fascinating, risky game, right? It is a game, but it's definitely not just for having fun. Uh, and even though there is a component of gamble, it doesn't explain, and, and there is a taste in gamble, because we know that we have, but still, that is driven by a motivation. It is what you are at, what, what what is at stake, and the odds. It's something that you will calculate, because you don't you don't gamble for something that, that is costless. And I presume that this is the greatest weakness of Yuzinga's um, theory that it doesn't take into consideration that societies that make war have always killed each other in the most brutal possible ways even in this kind of golden age is speaking of. So you have to understand in there that war has an intensity per se, that even when you find a, a highly ritualized military context, that doesn't mean that those guys are, you know, wouldn't kill each other otherwise, but they do like that, which is, seems less intense, because objectively it has less motivation, they have less reason. Right, a more advanced civilization will simply say, "Okay, we are not at war most of the time. If we have to have when we have to do it, we have to wipe the hell out of ch uh, out of the, the enemy military, and to get the thing done, and not like prosecuting maybe this ritualistic game for for generations and generations with people regularly being killed on the long run just because of a you know a sick twisted game at that point. I mean, is there somebody here that just like to make war around uh, for the taste of it?" Uh, or because there is no specific or evident reason why wars are fought or made, 
that can be found today, independently from whether wars are, you know, seem, you know, kind of a good or bad thing or not. I could find at the time for the fight over, I don't know, resources, uh, you know, cattle, uh, pastors, all this stuff. And uh, I'd rule it out, right? And the only thing that is usually, you know, the, 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 the often the, even the, the, the deteriorate level here of criticism, that there are people who naturally criticized Yudzinga because he dared say that war is, uh, is a game. Ah, war is a serious thing, tragically serious. Well, the same Yudzinga, you gotta give it, that of course he knows that, right? It doesn't actually, um, uh, of course, it's not, out, it's not self uh, remunerative, right? And um, the because that's also where Yudzinga goes for, right? The idea that you essentially fight for this, for feeling better with yourself. This may be interesting. I don't know whether he takes the path that can be even, you know, similar to Lawrence one, that is to say, war is fought maybe because we need uh, to to fight a certain point to, 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 to want it to obtain something. I mean, obviously, also Yudzinga says that... Uh, you know, war ha recognizes that war is, uh, you know, fought for achieving a certain purpose. But if you miss at that point that that what you can achieve is um, is at hand without recurring to that kind of ritualistic aspect or respect for the enemy, um, uh, you know, why wouldn't you use it, right? Where, where, where's the deteriorate aspect of civilization there and saying, okay, we can't grab that and uh, we just have to fight and maybe again that move will prevent you know more dead even than you know a prolonged ritual ritualized warfare right the history of civilization is fundamentally a history of increase also of pacification I mean look at uh, the great empires even just you know the passage from the the polis uh, to to the Hellenistic kingdoms or I don't know, from uh, from the communal states to the seniors in Italy, there you find a process of state building in the meanwhile, that in the more primitive time where war was seasonal, you fought only against your neighbor for a, for a period of time, were first of all ferocious things, ferocious things had nothing to be, and the fact that war just increased by scale, however, doesn't mean that the results weren't good, because act freaking states with, you know, pretty damn level of advancement and internal pacification were created, right? Which is, in a broader sense, also what society has headed towards, and that's why we have a freaking decent quality of life after millennia of, you know, of hell. And, and it did pass also through war, yes. But in that sense, do not criticize Yudzinga because he dare say that war is a game. War is a game. And the same von Clausewitz said, and I'm starting to think he probably got it from him um, at some point. And the same Yudzinga understands, indeed, the deep seriousness of such game. Absolutely. Right. Um, um, there are um, interesting studies, for example, the one... Um, by René Girard uh, that uh, deal with the relation between the violence and sacred and the holy, let's say, uh, th that are relations that um, in war, as in tragedy, are evidenced with the greatest clarity and that allow to intend it as a sort of great sacrifice of cosmic expiation. Um, this is a very interesting approach because naturally when we look at poetry, uh, or, you know, or religion. Uh, so some of the deepest manifestations of civilization, we, we do see this inherent um, drama in it. And very often war and, and other, I mean, relational uh, problems, I mean, uh, that have to do with certain values, with certain rules, right? Uh, with what can be done, what can't be done, with the, the foundation, the cornerstone of, of the political and social order are always involved. Um, but even here we have to stay with our feet on the ground, meaning that, of course, um, culture represents what, what is a big deal, after all. In I mean, if you read the Iliad, you cannot fail to recognize the importance of war, and in that 
political and social background um, in those societies, but not about war, not even about a bro. Because at that point you have to explain why somebody would close in and risk his own life seriously with, with a, such an increased um, you know, risk for, for what and, and how collectively, how do they organize themselves. So great respect for Lawrence, but still, you know, he's being profitably criticized. Another very important author uh, also that I like uh, very much is Carl Schmidt, who, um, you know, helped us um, with his exegesis of the concept of hostess, of enemy, and the relation uh, instituted between uh, external war and internal cohesion of group on the base of this. That is, you know, um, the enemy becomes a political category that we use to say, okay, these those are the bad guys, we should go kill them. Um, that is too much uh, entirely political. As we've seen, Lawrence is too much biological in a sense. Um, Schmidt is too much political. So obviously there is a political element. Obviously there is a natural element. Obviously there is a, a gambling element. So we see from Witzinga, Lawrence and and Schmidt that we actually get the the, the three, all the, the elements of the Clausewitzian trinity, right? But he, how these are coupled and they uh, I mean coupled, they're, they're brought together and to form and how do they decline also in, in a not just from an individual point of view, but in a social sense, in all its different declinations, the, you know, and how they, I mean, bring into war, that is not explained by these individuals that also have, as we've seen, different degrees of, of understanding of, of, this, of this aspect. Are particularly interesting, in my opinion, because they already began to drive away from the idea that there is a kind of a innate... Um, collective necessity for for fighting war. I mean, they they both explained uh, different uh, aspect the, the aspects of how human violence is triggered, but they don't make it a ne necessary thing. They 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 say how this is used uh, even in conflict, uh, any war, but they they don't totalize it. They just say, look. Uh, either man is triggered by this or even he creates his own reason for fighting okay but they they don't say something like you think that goes as far as saying ah you know it's, it was all about a game then humans got bad for some reason we don't understand and that and that's pretty much it um when um this i mean we have acknowledged in in the phone Krieger series how important military history in the not in, in the military story in the military history it is in the military research is for understanding war itself it, it seems banal von Clausewitz says that the best way to understand what war is is to actually command an arm to have an experience of command um, and in, in that military history however is a, a, a complement to it be, because at the end of the day, it's it's still about reflecting about actual real war that happened. So either you commanded, which was a more way more intense and direct and real experience, or you study war afterwards, and you could be even the same person, the same from Clausewitz did it for you know uh, operations he participated to, and this importantly shifts the attention towards the core of the matter. That is, if you want to understand war, it's useless that you start making. Uh, you know, start wondering why this happens if you don't even study it. I mean, how it's actually carried out. This is a great problem that uh, afflicts, um, in a sense, uh, Kriegsgeschichte, Militärgeschichte. Um, uh, that is, who is a military historian? Who is a historian of the art of war? I would say the best way to understand war is the latter. That is, uh, until you you don't get how war is practically waged that is to say if you don't if you don't know how to literally how how an army is led at least not how to lead an army yourself but also um but through military history how an army is led is how it functions on the field how common it is you can't properly even you know 
even if you're a military historian, that is, you study war in the sense, I don't know, I'm a military historian because I studied the uniforms or the logistics or whatever of this thing, but you don't study the art of war, how armies actually change over time, and how they're used in the field, and why they do like that. You can't properly get at the core of the matter, right? This is excruciatingly important because we have a dramatic lack of these individuals. I take pride from saying it, at least I attempt to studying the theory of the art of war, both reading the von Krieg and, uh, I mean, studying the von Krieg and studying actual campaigns and battles that I do for a living from some, more than some year now. And objectively, I must tell you that my understanding of history improved dramatically through this because it's not understanding and that's what people that come from the outer side do not get it and most things when one before doing them you don't really you can't really know uh, concretely what it is that studying the, the, the art of war uh, effectively makes you understand why that things happens in the first place not how, just how it works but how humans literally make war and that makes you realize from a myriad of of elements what is properly the humanity that stands behind it like um, and how this naturally acts politically socially because as we've seen war is fundamentally derived from that um, so the excess can go i mean there are a lot of people that legitimately study i don't know disciplines such as the history of production of arms and armaments uh, from the technological point of view uh, we appreciate that because it works. We it's needed. Uh, even museology or military collectionism um, does, you know, bring the historian to widen its own understanding. So, so, a lot of aspects in a multifaceted way, right? A, a, a greater insistence on that, let's say, brings to you know the historian to, to to reduce himself to the rank of pure consulent of war games, you know, uh, amateurs. But um, of course, war must be studied altogether too as the history of events of institutions of social structures techniques costs inventions discoveries right that um, naturally doesn't have to lead to the methodologically utopistic um, shoals of a history of, of war conceived as a total history because we can't be expert about uh, experts about everything we necessarily have our limits and that brings to to a greater problem that is how much do we, can we understand war completely that is uh, can we have a greater view all that let's say in a functional sense well yes it's the close of its in method that's why you talk about it so much and that's why the art of war is the single most important thing um, and here many even of, of the finest thinkers fall because when you don't come from that background when you have never studied a campaign or a battle from the actual sources in a serious way for months or years and you don't do it over and over again for the rest of your life objectively you can easily indulge into certain simplifications that um, really do not render honor to their otherwise good achievements um, the idea that a polymolog polymological science that is fundamentally between history and sociology uh, can scientifically examine the, 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 the military phenomenon uh, it's not a you know by approximation it's not a bad idea but even here we have to be cautious uh, the father of polymology is considered the this, this scholar mm, Gaston Boutoul that uh, wrote a work known, uh, known as Le, Le Guerre um, that contains, I would say, a complete uh, picture of the object of his studies. And uh, his, um, you know, notions are interesting. I, I share uh, many of them. Uh, even, actually, I've always thought of them without even knowing him uh, at the time and for example um, the mm, there is a frequent mistake uh, or at least uh, this doesn't usually mm, hits the 
the misunderstanders of war, right? But mostly those who study war. Uh, that is a positivistic, rationalistic approach. And that Boutoul debunks, that is, the uh, belief of the exclusively conscious and voluntary character of, um, of wars, right? But more than that, in the sense that we often think of this of politics or, or society, it's very easy, especially when you, the younger you are, to, to try to make sense of big issues by saying, to have kind of a deterministic view, saying, oh, things had to go like that because of, of that reason. It's said, the more you of this broader structural cause, the more you go on, and especially the more you study military history, you realize how even minimal events, single people, made uh, a, an enormous difference altogether. Uh, even some of the most single most important things, and that you realize if things had gone otherwise, history would have been completely different. Another very interesting um, position that uh, uh, Boutoul comes up with is the delusion to be able to prevent uh, war uh, by using complex juridical systems, which definitely stems as a view from, uh, from a moralistic approach to war. I mean, thinking that if you actually teach people not to fight, they will not fight. I mean, if you have a, at least a decent understanding in the history of mankind, you realize that this is not a lost cause because humans, and that's the, the rhetoric that we should erase from our mind, humans like to make war to each other, is that if wars are fought, usually there is a, not a, uh, let's say, a good, moralistically speaking, but there is a sound reason, this is the best there, there is a sound reason why they are fought, right? Wars are literally the, uh, the, the human activities were the, the marginal mistake uh, or at least of the void of foundation of its motives is true, right? Because if, if whoever decided to go at war, it had um, the, the position, the, the, the support, um, and the motive at that point of a, the majority of society. So this doesn't mean that society is, is always right. Actually, you know, this is not true at all. But still, Altogether, there are broader reasons to, that brought to a war that are not just, you know, this is just a bad idea. There were motives that, if you even if you don't justify, you can't understand. And that especially, as we were saying before, uh, with the other intuition of Boutoul, um, are not easily uh, easily calculatable at the point. Because also, historically speaking, we need a bit of perspective. I mean, uh, before, I don't know, World War I, nobody could practically know what would have happened. This is the problem. We can't tell the future. Mm -hmm. And this is where Boutoul eventually will fall. Because um, he, uh, by, he's, he's remarkable. He's, I mean, his skepticism about pacifism and the critical to the juridical illusion of international uh, regulation of the peace phenomenon uh, brought to this finally to the, the, the idea that, that the war phenomenon must be studied without moralizing prejudices right but he also slipped in my opinion um, when he with his work decided to raise an hypothesis that foresees the periodicity of war I haven't read that specifically but uh, Clausewitzianly wise, I can't say why it's not correct. Um, not because war will not represent itself. Of course it will, right? But uh, even just empirically, military anal analysts do not reason more than three, four months ahead in realistic sense for governments to act upon that and prepare for wars. Um, why? Because what happens beyond is too unpredictable, given the, the standard... Um, level of change and even think about I don't know about coronavirus where thought that that could happen not many so the unforeseen is always behind the corner you can never know uh, even in situations of norm normality and what is normality by the way 
Secondly, the periodicity of war, you would say, well, but what about seasonal warfare? You know, if you looked at the ancient war, it was always like that during the summer, they, 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 they went raiding and then the winter things stopped. Yes, there was a periodicity of war in that sense, but that periodicity is not calculable if you don't calculate that whole society. That can be predictable in that sense, but not in the outcomes, first of all, and secondly, not even in the actual operations and you you may never know what will bring to those decisions there's not a mechanism that brought every year that single thing to happen that periodicity for example periodicity excuse me is uh was not always true right it's not true that every summer there was a war out there uh and and the reason why there would be or there wouldn't be was often triggered by by, by factors that were very um, you know even detached from war itself i mean um, certain broader social and political balances, individuals that made a change, and still there is a broader interaction of fluidity. So, how are you going to predict a war concretely? You can think it's more or less likely. Yes, we live in the world that we know what this is fundamentally about. So, of course, we're going to expect new wars. We can't even say you know, new will break out in the next years. It's pretty certain, right? It's very likely, right? But where is that going to happen? How, how much is it going to cost? And who is going to bet on it? Who in the market is going to bet on it? On, on a value that sur surpasses one of the human life, on the market at least. Um, would you do it? Not begging, you know, it's just a game, right? It's just a form of entertainment. No, no, really, you know. Would you bet your house? Would you bet your public um, security? Uh, would you bet, uh, you know, in fact, the life of your family on it? Because that's what war will bring. And the answer is no. And it is no, because you don't know that. <laughs> Nobody does. Right? And and that's what gives you how serious war factually is in this regard. That is to say, um, the predictability of it uh, is a nonsense. It's... It, it's it's part of the reason why you should, I mean, if you are a disadvantage at the point of somebody thinking to, to exploit that weakness, if you haven't real, if you realize it, you fix it. If you haven't realized it, you can't predict it. That's what war is. And today we didn't talk much about the concept of symmetry and asymmetry, um, which I will spare you uh, at this point. But uh, let's say that the you know, the talks around war in this regard are in ph philosophical nature, not very useful until you study it. For example, there is um, an extraponomology, uh, the rise of ironology, the, the study of peace, right? So, misconceptually conceived as the other phase of the war phenomenon, right? Peace does not exist because conflict is always there, and if, if you count peace as a non-war, it's just basically, you know, saying that death is absence of life. What, what are you studying exactly? Um, and um, this is, however, a, a branch of studies began by Victor Werner at the University of Bruxelles. Um, but the success of it is seemingly most related to a sort of lexical pruderie. Right, the, the, the study of peace may seem uh, less compromising than the one of war, but it's just basically studying war under f from a different profile. And therefore, in my opinion, it's not very uh, useful, right? No, before then, even very interesting, telling the truth. Uh, and in fact, euphemisms aside, it's evident that even if we admit that um, sci pure sciences, hard sciences, let's say, exist, polyemology cannot be, right? Um, the, let's say, polyemology has, in a sense, the task, not much to contemplate war, but to transform itself, obviously in its country, that is, to demythicize war, right? Studying it, its structures, mechanisms, so that you can some would say, mm, let's say, foresee and prevent. I would say to uh, expect and to fight, right? 
not because you must fight it, but because it will happen and then it will be useful for you to know how war works, right? So, no, I'm not a great fan of the phrase we should study war so that we can prevent it. I think we should study war because we can use it when it's needed and not use it when it's not needed, but not to prevent it in the first place. Of course, preventing it if there is a better option. Of course, and that, as we've seen, happens most of the time. But it doesn't have to assume a totalizing value because otherwise it would mean to simply, you know, deny the use of violence for ethical uh, purpose. Um, and polemology has a huge ethical purpose, that is to teach us the importance of violence when, uh, as, a, as an instrument to intervene in favor of, you know, of the helpless, of those who are, you know, suffering a crime, etc. And that's how every state in the world has a military, has security forces. Guess why? Right? And nobody has anything to complain about that. Uh, not even pacifists. But at the end of the day, that's what the military does. It kills. It's trained to kill. And nothing else, right? There, there, there can be, yes, a broader uh, value, um, system of values of, in fact, of uh, political allegiance and civic duty and things that are very, very, very important and the military does teach. I, I wouldn't like to make this video by saying that, by giving the impression that I don't have respect towards the military per se, right? I try to, to explain that, as I was saying before, not necessarily making war means to understand it. Um, and do not be surprised if, you know, many, I mean, most military men do not even know what the Clausewitz in theory consists in, right? And this has nothing to do with saying, well, yeah, but they know how to make war. No, sadly not. Um, and this has been proved historically, right, by people, for example, were were highly schooled in von Clausewitz but got it totally wrong. And, I mean, they got right certain points because they were they got them right, but they, they, they failed badly at others, and th there are other people out there that do not even have this kind of, of of military education and that just have kind of certain models to follow given certain situations, just obey orders, but not quite understanding what war is. It's not a provocation to say that military historians today, uh, at least especially the historians of the art of war, understand war better than the average military man. It is true. Uh, it, it's not a matter of saying, yeah, therefore you're bad, you think you're bad. No, uh, I don't. Um, and there are two different things um, with two different purposes that converge a certain point but also follow different paths. Um, the, there, there is a broader moral issue here that is the, um, the ethical one uh, that is probably the most important to stress um, and I wouldn't repeat now why you know that you know the, the benefit that we can get from learning about violence um, but rather to warn from certain positions right uh, humanity and not just for example the Christian or the post Christian one or the modern postmodern one has always kept um, in in the deepest of its heart and um, perhaps we, we could say for once uh, since ever, you know, the myth of peace. Uh, even if in its history has concretely s walked uh, on the path of war on a regular base. There is a reason even be behind, behind this because naturally we, we, we acknowledge the, uh, the, the inherent danger and risk that war brings and the fact that still we, we have to do it. So the meat of peace does help, after all, as a counter altar to mitigate uh, militaristic positions. Yes, there can't be pacifism without militarism, indeed, um, from the other side. Um, but at the same time, we insisted a bit too much, in my opinion, on the essential and absolute value of peace, right? Not because, as we've seen, peace uh, and exactly, I would say, because peace does, doesn't quite exist as such, but if not in opposition to war, right? What is that you think? Because what is peace at the end of the day, right? Are people that are in peace actually thinking about it? Um, and if they do, they wouldn't do it if, if there wasn't war there, 
right? You could say vice versa. Yes, but war is something more limited that has, in spite of its terrible nature, a specific aim. Peace doesn't quite have it. I mean, peace has an end to itself, uh, while war does not have an end to in itself. And peace doesn't tell people what to do. It just makes them free to do what they, they want. And uh, uh, absolute freedom is not really even a good recipe for a peaceful coexistence, in the sense that you must have an order there, you have, must even have a conflict in a one, if you want to have a society. Um, so the question here is, um, does war help to build peace in a sense? Well, in a way, yes. I mean, uh, of course, uh, this sounds controversial, but the, the reason of why we fight is at the end of the day to, to gain uh, peace once again, right? The conflict will always be there, but at the end of the day, the motivation of war is to stabilize, not, not, it's, it doesn't have an end in itself. Um, but even if the war was so terrible that we realized we, we need to create another a disillusion of peace for which we should, that everybody should seek as just a, a blindly positive thing that is, however, without consistency in itself. It doesn't quite exist. Um, and it's it's difficult, in fact, to to deny the um, say biological mechanisms and interpersonal or social relations that bring to war. I mean, societies. I mean, if if there wasn't peace, uh, you couldn't you couldn't go at war. I mean, that that's the same line we've drawn, right? It's humans that make wars. And they don't do it accidentally. It's not like you know, a, you know, lightning from the sky that happens every once in a while. They can wander about. This is something you actively do. I mean, there are great masses of people that decide altogether to go kill somebody to to to, to get something from them. So the reasons there, uh, uh, you know, to oblige them to do something, say better, more, more neutral in the cause of its in way. Uh, because even in here, it's all also the the question. Ah, it's always about the struggle for resources, right? Uh, mankind will never learn so greedy. Well, it's not even about that. I mean, obviously, war is about uh, controlling more uh, resources, whichever they are. But what you can do with those resources in your control instead in someone else's control can make actually a big deal of difference, right? Who would you have preferred to have the world in control of, you know, uh, by 1945? In, in the United States hands or in, in the in the Nazis hands <laughs> yeah you know yes it was a control of a struggle over resources but you know there is some additional value in there uh, that we are all happy for things how things ended at least um, and so what are we talking about even um, war is surely made by armies uh, organized violence armaments but behind that there is, uh, uh, as we have seen uh, from von Clausewitz, uh, uh, a world, politics, society, economical blocks, financial maneuvers, diplomatic expedients. So always, I stress this: never make, the, uh, never mistake, uh, never equate war with conflict. Always remember that war is violence enacted, whereas conflict is are the broader reasons to bring to that. Right. So never mix. Never make this kind of sil asinine mistakes like saying, oh, this was a political war, right? Uh, the, these terms invented, but war is uh, is political by definition. You need, it's like saying military fortification, it doesn't make any sense, right? It's already like that. And those are the kind of prudent, idiotic, hypocritical mm, phrases invented by people that want to, don't want to say, that need to specify for, for the dummies that wars are not just, I don't know, religious or economical or whatever, but they're a, a complex system of things. So you say political, it sounds neutral enough. But war is war, and it's motivated by all those things at once. Um, that and, and it is enacted by politics, indeed. So it's kind of uh, superfluous to stress that. Um, in any way, the, the, the bigger deal here that today we don't discuss, also going to hand here, it's the uh, it's violence as the scandal, right? Um, I, I don't. I won't even say in war, because as we've seen, 
war is, is violence enacted. So it's violence itself. Violence is scary, objectively. Um, because you know why? Because if we weren't aware of the importance of violence, we wouldn't be human. Because humanity does recognize itself in violence. We are the ones who enact that. Um, but it's also in relation to it that we feel how necessary it is to change that. Guess why? Because the way we make war today is, after all, the result of a civilization process. That is, before, uh, we made war for things that uh, we were kind of compelled to do. Today we have an option, because we, we kind of compartmentalize war. Uh, yes, it can be unleashed from a moment to another. We should never think it's over, and that's why we, we worry about that. But at the same time, we have to recognize that we live in a dramatic better moment, especially, you know, from, you know, if you, well, this is complicated, let's say in pre-industrial times, war was something at least much more habitual for mankind, in a sense. Now, we know how to use it, and it's more devastating, and we have learned it the hard way, um, but it's more devastating because the interests have increased. We want to live in a better world, of course, interests are going to increase. Right, and we need a way to control that. And after all, we have done, you know, if you re look at the 20th century, we'd say, oh my God. Uh, but in a sense, I mean, it could go far worse. And you know what I mean. Um, we have learned through the, the same mistake to contain this, to regulate this, to bring an order, to mm, maintain under control forces that humanity before had never controlled. And these are forces that, we're not talking about nuclear weapons, just. I'm talking about, you know, industrial capacity, uh, you know, wealth distribution, this enormous masses. I mean, uh, 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 dynamics that are scary, right, for, for, for ancient standards, for pre-industrial standards in general, and that somebody has to control. So war, in that regard, is, uh, you know, f for how disturbing it looks, it's also, you know, you know, it's way more contained that it, that it is, right? And, and you, the, there are, I inserted even in the background pictures that famous chart that was made some, um, some, um, some years ago that shows how objectively we, yes, I mean, warfare went down, right? The, 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 there are ups and downs in, in warfare in, in human history, but we're living in a relatively peaceful time. And considering our capa distracting capability, distracted capabilities, and the, the we that's a pretty good job. Also, because here we're talking about relative terms of destruction, right? Uh, uh, and and this means that since we we are larger communities, that in absolute terms is also much larger. So we're preventing a lot, paradoxically. Um, paradoxically, because we're not used to think like that, but it wouldn't be strange otherwise. Right, if you look at the actual mass behind this, and it's no abstraction, right? It's, we're talking about millions and millions of people were alive. With the, you know, if you look at the average, uh, the human average in the previous time in history, uh, it's a damn miracle. Um, all right, so I would say we we finish here for today because these topics are dense. And we will surely come back on them at some point. For now, I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.